Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Field on the program today. We have Philip Perea, the host of uh, the uh, the writer, I should say, of uh, Minute Dot and a financial advisor. And we also have uh, uh, Jason McPhee, who is an engineer for the state of California. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Free speech, fragility, polarization. Uh, what's we're doing the the year in review here, uh, and and free speech and, and fragility among people who are, I think, what's the word? Uh, snowflakes. Uh, that seems to be the, the the popular word right now. What is happening when the ACLU refuses to defend free speech that they don't like? Well, one of the things that uh, has come out of it all year, and it was uh, probably going back into 2016 around the elections time, when we found that it was the liberal campuses, or uh, it's a misnomer, uh, the progressive campuses, that uh, were refusing to hear free speech. And uh, they had contracted people, even, you know, I, I believe um, uh, Condoleezza Rice was actually banned from a, uh, from a speech. And so it seems to be that if you had to characterize where the, uh, the ban on free speech seems to be coming from, it seems to be coming from the progressives, and violently so. Uh, I think it really comes down to uh, failed ideas and patently failed ideas for a century. And so any, any evidence presented to uh, contradict the progressive narrative, the collectivist narrative, uh, seems to be uh, the kind of thing that has to be squashed right away. And those ideas cannot be allowed to be promulgated in our schools or talked about in hallways or anything like that because uh, the, the whole narrative of progressivism has been collapsing all around the world. And you, know, you see it in every government around the world. Well, you say the narrative has been collapsing. And we see that in the, in the, in the collapse of, of uh, avowedly socialist countries like Zimbabwe, Venezuela, et cetera, uh, Eastern Europe a few years ago. Uh, but on campuses, we don't see a collapse. We see pretty much total control by the hard left of the professor, pro professoriate and, and, uh, and, and a, a good portion of the student body uh, as well. In fact, uh, in, uh, I forget the name of the college down in Southern California, there was a, a, guy, a, a guy who was a member of the uh, the state Libertarian Party uh, Executive Committee, who was a student and uh, was trying to hand out constitutions, little pocket can constitutions sure. yep. and uh, declarations of independence on campus, and was told you can't do that because and, you know unless you stand in a free, free speech, speech zone, zone right. which was like you know a ten square foot area out in the middle of you know behind where, where the where garden no, shed, I where, believe, where, yeah. where, where, <laughs> no, where nobody walks. Uh, what is it about the the colleges that they think they can get by with? Uh, essentially ruling out people handing out constitutions. Well, when you think about, uh, you know, the, uh, somebody going $100,000 in debt, how much big money is really involved in the higher education racket that, uh, again, it is so important that they towed the party line. And now you've got this idea, even when I went to college uh, back in the day, back in Davis, you were told what to write. And if you didn't write it, you're going to get a bad grade, and if uh, you get a bad grade, there goes your future. And so they're very, there's and You're talking about in the social, the social sciences. I'm, I'm talking about it in English literature. Okay, well, social uh, sciences. And so it was absolutely verboten to um, express any idea, no matter how well considered, how well written, uh, that was not on the party line because there's so much at stake. I completely understand it. When you talk about uh, the salaries and the, and the tenure and the retirement plans and the massive amount of money that is going in to fund higher education, the minute somebody says the emperor's got no clothes, meaning that higher education doesn't really have any utilitarian value. You make an interesting point. When I went to college, which was uh, you know back in the uh, Jurassic period, uh, I remember spending $150 per quarter for tuition. Yeah. And then I, and then I had to pay, you know, pay for my own room and board, which was, you know, probably not much more than that. Right. Uh, and I was able to work my way through college with no problem. As took, did I. It, you know, it took me a few years, but I, but I, you know, it was, it was, it was not, it was not difficult. No loans. You know, it's not right. possible yeah. uh, anymore for most people to do that. And the difference between now and then is that now 
student loans are yours for the asking if you can fog a mirror and have a warm body. Back then, student loans were more difficult to come by and carried steep interest rates and had to be repaid. Now, anybody can get a student loan. Of course, you can't discharge it in bankruptcy because you can't have by that. The government. Uh, but all of that f essentially found money going into education has served to, I think, do what you're talking about, which is make college a very, very lucrative thing for the people who are the professoriate or the administration. And let's not discount that it's worth, in interest payments alone, $50 billion a year to the U.S. government on, the U.S. government owns most of the student loans, even with the banks as middlemen, but the U.S. government owns all of the student loans. It's worth $50 billion a year just in interest payments. There's an outstanding balance now of something like $1.2 trillion owed to the federal government. Now, who do you think uh, is, has the, the most vested interest in making sure that the people that are going through that system are going to be loyal to those payments, are going to be loyal to the collectivist agenda, which is the heart of federalism. You know, there's, a, there's another interesting part about all this, too. There's this distortion that you guys are talking about with all this government money coming in and, and uh, incentivizing people to take a lot of courses and such that they might not otherwise take. But uh, there's also within the, uh, within the social studies, there's been this, I guess, this lack of diversity that's been developing of ideas that's been uh, growing throughout that, uh, those institutions. And a key figure at the heart of this right now is an author named Jonathan Haidt. And so it, it, I would encourage the listeners, uh, if, if you can, to go out and uh, check out some YouTube videos. He's, he's written a book, the, uh, the Righteous Mind, and he's written, recently written a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, which uh, very much speaks to why these people, these snowflakes, are showing up at college, and they're not able to handle, I guess, criticism of their ideas, and so such that they have to seek protection from the... From the um, administration of the colleges. So I think a lot of this is really part of what's building into this is just that uh, you know, young people are, are, are being coddled and, and not challenged as they grow up and, and we have this lack of diversity of the professoriate uh, going in there, especially in the social studies where essentially you're getting really one flavor of opinions that is being taught. And I think it goes back before, uh, before college. I mean, we have now a uh, fear-based uh, society where uh, if, a, if, a, if a kid walks his dog, you know, let's say an eight, nine, ten-year-old kid walks his dog around the block, there's a very high chance in some neighborhoods that uh, the cops will be called because somebody is not paying attention, not, not you know, hovering over him. We're encouraging helicopter parenting to the uh, nth degree and making it very, very difficult, basically making it difficult to move out of childhood. We've created an adolescence and now extended that adolescence from the teenage, from the junior high years all the way through high school. Well, exactly, because the child is always looking for an immediate authority of figure to go and resolve their problems, you know, with that helicopter parenting and, and such that that's what they're looking for when they get to the uh, universities as well. And, now, and in fact, there's now a thing called free range zones, uh, allowing kids to go out and explore the neighborhood and, and you know, play in the park without, without constant... Uh, 100, you know, 24-7 supervision. And, well, and there know. was an interesting uh, uh, kind of a, uh, thinking beyond that. What, what they found was that by coddling children and not letting them injure themselves in small ways, on the slide, on the swings, what have you. Yeah, don't get me started on the slides and, and on the swings <laughs> that, that have more concrete seats. You know, like never mind concrete. concrete. Yeah. Uh, that what has happened is that children are not able to understand risk in small ways and never develop then the understanding of risk in large ways. Uh, so that, you know, a small pain, a skin knee, you know, even a broken arm taking a chance, uh, a child internalizes what, what kind of risk taker they are. If they never have that opportunity and they reach the adulthood where the world is far more dangerous, they have no way, they have no mechanism to manage risk. And so this becomes actually by coddling, by, by be, being helicopter parents and preventing the broken arm and the skin knee, what we are actually doing is setting them up for um, uh, far greater harm as they Once they get out of college, years. because the protection continues through college. <laughs> uh, f talking about free speech, there is uh, no free speech for, uh, 
Nazi pug lovers? What, 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 what are you talking about? Well, so in, uh, in the UK, uh, or uh, I guess in Britain, uh, there's this uh, uh, sort of comedian, I guess, on YouTube, and he had uh, his own YouTube channel. And so I guess to uh, do some kind of a joke with his uh, girlfriend's pug, I believe, he, he decided it would be funny uh, to teach her to do uh, a Nazi salute every the time. Pug. Yes, the pug. It, every time he saw Hitler on television, you know, or the Nazis say Heil Hitler, the, the pug immediately was trained to, to do that. And he thought it was hysterical. And whether or not you think it was a good joke, the, the uh, British authorities didn't think it was a good joke. Well, I and, think it's a terrible <laughs> joke. But, 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 but what, what happened to him for well, doing and, a bad joke? So apparently they have uh, some speech codes over there in Britain, and uh, they determined that uh, his humor was not humorous, but actually grossly offensive. And because it was grossly offensive, um, they were charging him with a crime, and he could have gone to jail, and he was uh, being faced with fines. And I believe in the end, um, he was able to evade the jail sentence, but he was still forced to pay a fine. And it's, it's uh, just absolutely shocking. And there's been some other cases over there in Britain, too, as well, where, um, you know, uh, uh, other you know, famous individuals have had to come forth and step in for comedians and others who've, who've essentially said words that offended some of these snowflakes that we've been talking about in the early era. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's interesting you talk about uh, Britain, but in, in the U.S., going back to the college scene, Jerry Seinfeld refuses to do speaking engagements on college campuses because he's afraid that he'll offend somebody, I guess, or he'll be accused of offending somebody. And you can't talk about a more milk toast, uh, uh, you know, white bread comic than, than Jerry Seinfeld. I mean, he's about as inoffensive as you can get, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, but he's afraid to go on college campuses, refuses to do it. And we're, you know, we could hardly imagine what someone like a Richard Pryor, where, where he would stay, or George Carlin, would uh, stand today. I mean, imagine they would be drummed out for, uh, I mean, especially Carlin, you know, brilliant commentator, a funny man, but a brilliant commentator, and you look at his stuff and you say, well, that stuff wouldn't be allowed today, you know, unless... It, well, he was, it, he was enough on the left, so he could probably get by with it. You could always do it to the right. The yeah. comedian can do, to, can do whatever they want to the right, the Stephen Colbert's and what have you, but it cannot be done to the left. So, you know, the, there is, it's open season on a Trump. Um, everyone was kick gloves with Obama and Hillary, for that matter. And so the, the rule is that the left cannot be made fun of. Only the right can be made fun of. Well, then, but then there are alternatives. I mean, you can watch Rush Limbaugh make fun of the, the left, you know, uh, three hours a day, five days a week. It, is he is he still have a career? Or, yeah, I, I believe they ran him out. No, they, he's still they canceled the all his contracts, didn't they? He's still on the air, I think. Uh, accurate. <laughs> well, the, the the scariest thing of all this though is just the idea that you know, especially in the UK, and hopefully it doesn't carry over here, but that the government is starting to play a role in deciding what language is offensive and what language isn't, and that's you know when you start to get into some scary territory. You make a joke, and and you know, Big Brother is going to be looking over, and you have to check and see if Big Brother appreciated your humor. <laughs> well, one of the other permutations uh, is what I call jacques. If a, on on campuses, if a woman accuses a man, uh, a, a female co-ed accuses a male uh, student of inappropriate sexual behavior, the person who was accused essentially has no right to defend himself. It's, he, if he's accused, he's automatically considered guilty by the college and is probably going to get kicked out of college in many cases. Well, and uh, there's a, you know, the issue of my, the near and dear to my heart is, uh, you've mentioned in the past, I am a, uh, a poet in my uh, spare time and, you know, published, uh, widely published. What I found uh, was that there was this huge collectivist movement in the poetry world that's been going on for quite some time where you express only the approved political opinions, and nothing could be the death of poetry more than um, censorship. And so uh, what you will find in a world that is supposed to be the most creative, the most edgy, let's challenge, kind of like stand-up comics, oh. uh, you're finding that, uh, you know, for instance, there was a huge movement, a collectivist movement of poets to resist Trump when he was elected, mm -hmm. as if we were all of the same opinion. And if you weren't marching in line 
if you weren't writing about the things you're supposed to write about, uh, you didn't get published. It's that simple. And so if you think that this is, you know, not extending to um, our, our very culture, you know, what we see on TV, what we see in magazines, what we read in books, uh, it, you don't ever see it because it never got in front of the public eye. Well, it got on TV with the, uh, with the Kavanaugh hearings. <laughs> Comment. <laughs> Well, uh, and, and to me, that, that was uh, one of the most concerning things about the, the Kavanaugh uh, hearings is, is uh, you know, some people would say this is just a job interview, but essentially, you know, somebody came forward with an accusation, and the accusation was, I guess, vague to say the least, uh, you know, when you couldn't identify the time, the exact place, the exact people who were there, and then it's immediately put on somebody to defend themselves it, it's almost like being asked to prove a negative, which in philosophy is, is an impossibility, you know? So it's, it's starting to become scary when we get to a place in culture where I, I think it, there should be some standard to the accusations. And of course, in a court of law, you're expected to have a certain uh, degree of, of evidence before you can even go forward with a case. But in, in this particular case, it was, um, uh, because I guess the rules are a little bit squirrely with how they decide to put the uh, uh, nominate and, and um, well, I, I mean, in, in fairness, he was not being tried. It was sure. a job interview, uh, in, in essence. And uh, the person uh, Ford, the person who made the accusation, appeared credible on on, on the stand. Uh, you know, she was a sympathetic figure, and uh, I mean, I, I, hear, I heard commentators watching the hearing say. After she testified, he's not going to get he's not going to get uh, uh, confirmed, and that same person watching the rest of the uh, hearing and watching Kavanaugh testify said, "There's no way he's not going to get confirmed." So I mean, they were both credible in in a sense. Now uh, I, I have a whole lot of problems with Kavanaugh on other grounds. I I think he's terrible on the Fourth Amendment. I think he's terrible on on uh, the uh, way he is willing to treat. Uh, citizens who uh, happen to be of Muslim descent and are in the wrong country and in the wrong place at the wrong time, that those sort of things. He's, he's willing to give pretty much blank check to the uh, intelligence uh, community and to the uh, surveillance, and, state, yeah, yes. sur surveillance technology uh, state. So I, I, you know, I, I, I was not a, a Kavanaugh fan by any means. But I, I, I think that they ignored uh, the substantive things that were wrong with him in favor of the titillating. And this is one thing, too, when people use the defense that this was just a job interview, this is one thing I have to push back on a little bit, because I can't imagine any job interview where you would show up in a private business and immediately be told by one side that we're going to do anything we can to make sure that you're not hired. And, and that's essentially what was being said at the beginning of these, of these hearings. And so, you know, when you wind up, I, I think the most important thing when we have a, a government process is that it be transparent and and uh, fair as, as much as possible. And so therefore the rules really need to be established in advance. And we got to a point with the Kavanaugh hearings where the rules were sort of being generated on the fly. And I think that's where a lot of the problems came in. Well, and it looked in retrospect, especially where Ford was from, you know, San Jose, uh, how much was at stake for the Democratic or the progressives uh, with that nomination? That was going to tilt the court finally. And uh, I really, I think it was very much uh, like what we see with the public unions in California where there is no amount of money that they will not spend uh, to, you know, protect the things that... Well, yeah, you know, I mean, the activity uh, of Dianne Feinstein in particular was, was no abso that. absolutely horrendous. I mean, she uh, had, the, had this woman in her pocket uh, exactly. ready to testify, ready to tell her story and, and saved it until the very end when it was clear that they were not going to be able to stop Kavanaugh any other way. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was obviously uh, a political ploy on exactly. behalf of Dianne Feinstein, who, who was, I think, probably uh, you know, one of the most evil people that's ever uh, been able to get elected senator. Uh, <laughs> For life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, that's just my opinion, but you know, what can I say? Um, fake news is another story that's been big over the last 12 months. Now you can say, I mean, President Trump is complaining about fake news all of the time, but he's the guy that had uh, fake Time Magazine Person of the Year covers uh, hanging in his uh, hotels, right? Yeah, yeah. 
and I, I, I enjoyed having seeing this on the agenda tonight because it just so happens that today um, it hit the t it hit the wires that a journalist from Der Spiegel, whom CNN had named a journalist of the year, and who had been described in other uh, journalistic circles as a journalistic idol. Well, it turns out that the man uh, was absolutely writing fake news and had been for some time. And, you know, he, and he, he had finally admitted it when they caught him and uh, resigned. And he said, look, I was just, I, I needed to have a big story and I was afraid to fail. And so I just started making stuff up. What and was I, he writing about? I, well, I'm not as, with this guy. Uh, he, well, the big one was um, uh, that had not come to light was uh, a story uh, on Trump's America. Uh, and in it, he describes this small town that is, you know, as, as you can imagine, woe be gone, woe be gotten, and everything bad about them and all of that sort of thing, a little town in Minnesota. <laughs> and the people in Minnesota saw the article and said, hold on, the only thing he got right about this was the population. And I mean, it was just, and it was a long article, and it was simply made up whole cloth. And when he was finally confronted with the people of the town, that's when it became apparent that not only was that one faked, but that pretty much everything that he had written for the last several years had been fake. And so he, he should have got the publisher for fiction. <laughs> and, and so, and so, so, you know, it would be different if, uh, you know, Der Spiegel is, you know, Germany's, you know, uh, primary newspaper and, you know, journalist of the year by CNN, all of that stuff. So this was not, you know, some, some hack. This was, cause this was a well-regarded man. And uh, he, he was the one who finally had to admit that he was, not just that one, but most articles, he was making up whole cloth. Well, I mean, if you take a look at the, at the news media today, uh, other than a few libertarian uh, uh, publications, Reason comes to mind, uh, and, uh, and a few smaller uh, publications, most newspapers, most television stations, I think all cable television stations, cable news stations, are either in the Democrat tribe or the Republican tribe, and there's nothing in between. There's nobody that's pre even pretending to be a Cronkite or an Edward R. Murrow anymore. Well, yeah, you know, that's, that's one of the things, too, that I think all of this is showing in this fake news, is that there's a, this awful amount of polarization and echo chambers that are starting to develop. And, and I, I think, you know, in taking the, the uh, uh, first uh, topic that we talked about with Trump having Time Magazine pictures in his, in his own office that were fake, uh, it, it take it full circle to Time's cover uh, showing a girl separated from her uh, mother and and uh, showing Trump standing over her in a time cover and then having it be that that girl was not actually separated from her mother. It was just a, a story generated by time uh, uh, because they felt like it fit the narrative. And so they, they put that on the cover and and it, it's, it was kind of alarming too. You know, a lot of the people I talked with, and it was sort of like, well, it's still the, the, the spirit of it was true. and. You know, it, it, at some point, uh, you know, if, if you're comfortable with the media, I guess, shading all of the information that comes with you to, uh, to you, then that's when things are really starting to get disturbing because then we're just going to solidify those echo chambers and have a really, we're essentially two different Americas seeing two different you know, realities. Well, well, and the other thing that's going on, I think, that, that reinforces this whole tribal thing. You're either with us or against us. You're either a progressive or you're a... a, a, a a MAGA person, uh, you know, nothing, nothing, you know, nothing, nothing else exists. What it's doing is, well, one of the things it's doing is it's driving down the registration for both Democrats and Republicans whose uh, ranks have been uh, declining pretty significantly over the years. More and more people are calling themselves independents or libertarians, which is up 92 percent in the last uh, 10 years. The other thing that's happening is that um, the uh, the, uh, the, the internet, the, uh, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters, uh, all of the people who uh, make their money by selling your information, your likes and dislikes, you know, if you hit, the, hit a like on, on Facebook, it, automatic, it goes almost you know, directly to some advertiser who will try to sell you something based on that like. I mean, it, it's instantaneous, instantaneous based on algorithms. What that's doing is it's sorting people into, into tribes as well. So your Facebook feed, your Google search uh, results, all of them are going to be informed and molded by what you have liked and what you have uh, clicked on in the past. So you end up 
in an echo chamber online. Uh, if you're doing a Google search and you are you know, have not liked Trump in the past, you're going to get a lot of anti-Trump stuff. If you're, a, if, you're a, if you're somebody who did like Trump, you're going to get the opposite. It's a very, very uh, disturbing trend, and it's something that the, you know, that Facebook in particular is being called on, uh, and, the, and, the re, and the, the reaction is to, well, we'll, we'll start, we're going to start censoring uh, certain sites. And unfortunately, a lot of the sites that are being censored off the, off the platform are libertarian sites because they don't fit either tribal mold. Uh, mold. Well, and, you know, uh, there, there's been that discussion of uh, now regulating them. Uh, and Facebook, by the way, just got hit really hard uh, yesterday when it was uh, exposed that they had been selling the data to many more corporations than anybody had realized. Uh, you know, 150 major corporations, they were simply selling all the data. The, the response should be, as it, is, as it has been with me, actually, uh, personally, uh, the response is you just don't go there. Well, and the other thing is, I mean, this is going to end. And I think there's a good sign of that. that just, this occurred in November uh, in a closely fought election in Southern California. As more and more people say the Republicans are not telling us the truth, the Democrats are not telling us the truth, they're just trying to get us into, uh, into warfare and make us watch more TV because it's, it's sensational. In, in, in Riverside County, the mayor of Calamisa, the libertarian mayor of Calamisa, who had been successful in calling the, calling the, uh, the pension plan a scam and saying, this pension is going to bankrupt my city, we're gonna get rid of Cal Fire, we're gonna start our own fire department, he was able to, to accomplish that. He was able to bring in a, a, a fire department that was run by the city as opposed to contracted out to Cal Fire with the union uh, support and with all of the uh, disastrous pension funds. He was able to do that, and then he was able to parlay that success in Calamisa into a win for county supervisor of Riverside County, which is no small thing. He will have, he's one of five supervisors in a county of nearly two and a half million, which is the 11th largest county in the state. It's larger than 25 individual states, and uh, it's a $5 billion budget that he'll have 20% of uh, uh, control on. I think probably one of the first things is he'll do is he'll say, hey, this $200 million deficit that we're running, we need to work on that a little bit. And you'll also probably uh, work on touching the third rail of politics, retirement benefits, and do so successfully. That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint, www.accesssacramento.org, on the web, uh, on uh, Facebook, on YouTube, and uh, let's see, cable time is all over the place, as well as, of course, streaming live at uh, www.accesssacramento.org, uh, 8 p.m. Thursdays, noon Fridays, and 4 a.m. on Saturdays which is a good of the day in China. Thank you.